Nick Ospie, is um, that you? Nick yes, Ospie? it is. Uh, Matt Welch, my uh, my best fiend, Matt Welch, the Klaus Kinski of uh, to my Werner Herzog or. Uh, that's a that's an auspicious start. Is this your maiden voyage on um, on bloggingheads.tv? Yeah, it is. As a matter of fact, I uh, had uh, I remember uh, early on when this started. The first time I saw one, it was uh, Mickey Caps and Robert Wright, and I condemned it as a reenactment of a, a lost act of waiting for Godot. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I have to stand by that judgment. But uh, here I am. And I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to be here uh, with you, Matt. As you know, I am the uh, editor-in-chief of Reason.tv and Reason.com, and the co-author with you of uh, The Declaration of Independence, How Libertarian Politics Can Fix What's Wrong with America. Yes, and I am also the editor of Reason Magazine, which Nick used to edit back in uh, back in the good old days of yep. the early aughts. Uh, you know, if I can uh, point out too, Matt, just uh, 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 you'll remember uh, when I took over, uh, we used to get a lot of emails uh, and mail and people complaining about how the magazine really went downhill when Postrel stopped editing it, Virginia Postrel, my predecessor. And uh, you have to uh, give me the, you know, I gave you a solid because we really didn't get very many emails complaining about me leaving. Uh, uh, yeah, the, no, uh, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I was expecting the deluge, but uh, not really. Uh, no, uh, um, I, uh, I think I wrote in my uh, the first uh, editor's column after uh, taking over the magazine that, you know, the first rule of coaching is you never follow a successful coach, which I think put me in a, in a tough space and I uh, really made it easy for you. You're, uh, you know, you're following the Steve Marinucci of reason. So, so I'm not Joe Altabelli. I yeah. am... Uh, Yes. Uh, uh, Cal Ripken Sr. Yeah. Uh, we're already completely lost. Okay, off yeah. Track. So let's. Uh, we're here to talk about our book, uh, Awkwardly, since we co wrote it. Uh, and so, and we're here also on a, um, on a muggy Saturday in Washington, D.C., uh, hence my uh, casual Saturday uh, garb here, which is particularly awful, uh, for which I apologize to the internet. But this is also something like. 18 hours since the Republican Senate or the Republican led Senate in the great state of New York just legalized gay marriage. Right. Uh, what say you, Nick Gillespie? Uh, well, you know, I think this is a, uh, a great moment. Uh, and it's, uh, it's spectacular that it came on the uh, heels of President Obama being in New York for some kind of mega gigantic uh, fundraiser where. He kind of pussyfooted around the question of uh, gay marriage, and he made it, made, it, made it clear again that he doesn't actually believe in it, but he does think it should be a state issue, I guess unlike medical marijuana or marijuana legalization, where he has made it clear that his Justice Department will go in and attack people who actually uh, live in states that have legalized medical marijuana. Uh, but it's, uh, so I think, you know, I think it's a great victory and it's a great libertarian victory because clearly most conservative politicians and most Republicans on the national level are dead set against gay marriage. Uh, and I think that most liberals are. I mean, for instance, Bill Clinton, who signed the Defense of Marriage Act and who was full square behind it, he wasn't forced into it. Uh, Hillary Clinton has said the same thing. You know, there's not a lot of love for the idea of gay marriage, and I think it's a great step forward that is very much in the tradition of a kind of widening circle of inclusion and rights. And it's just, it's appalling. I mean, when you go back and you read stories about, uh, you know, today for sure, but in the past, uh, just what homosexuals have had to put up with, gays and lesbians have had to put up with for practicing, you know, a, a different type of sexuality. I mean, it's, it's, it's really appalling. And I, um, you know, I'm glad that New York has done it and that they've done it legislatively, that it's a major state. And, uh, you know, this, this means we're going forward in time. I think. There's a, a common, if not necessarily majoritarian uh, response on planets, uh, libertopia or libertarian, where you and I have uh, planted flags now yeah. and again. That um, you know, the most important thing to do is to get the government out of marriage altogether. Yeah. That is the uh, typical. That's how Ron Paul answered the gay marriage question at the last Republican national debate. And I got to say, of all of the stock answers uh, from from Planet Libertarian, that is the yeah. one that I've all, I found among the least satisfying out there. I have never heard, and maybe there are those people, and I want I want to meet them 
yeah. uh, or I want to know where they live so I, so I can uh, avoid them, or I don't know what. But uh, where has there ever been someone saying, let's get the state out of heterosexual marriage? You right. know, like, or when they hear that their friend is getting married, like, oh, I hope that's not being approved by the state. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, it's a strange, I mean, I understand the philosophy behind it, and I might even agree with it, although it's, it's a, uh, you know, who knows how many different ways that you intersect with governments at any level, and at some point, do they need to recognize uh, that you are, are uh, married or not? Uh, but it is not ever going to happen in our lifetimes. Right. There are so many things that the state needs to get out of first, but maybe before marriage, uh, uh, that I've never really understood that answer as a, uh, a satisfying thing when you're just talking about, hey, look, these people want to get married. What the hell? Yeah, I, uh, so. I agree. And, uh, you know, it's, it's never a good idea as we are releasing a libertarian manifesto. And obviously you and I um, you know, believe in libertarian perspectives, the idea of, uh, as we talked about in the book, of democratizing and decentralizing power, of bringing more people into the decision-making process and giving them more control over the decisions that are most important to their lives. Uh, to start trashing libertarians, but it is um, it's always it's always frustrating um, that you know this kind of uh, situational federalism comes up. And to be honest, I mean this is something in past debates I can remember having both with uh, conservatives and liberals and libertarians is that you know if I, I mean I believe in federalism in the sense that I believe in running you know we should be running tons of experiments and living uh, because that's how we learn that's how we learn what works what doesn't work it's always good to kind of you know it's like um, trying out a new fabric softener on something you want to try it or a, a cleanser you want to try it on a small unobtrusive part of the fabric before you go whole hog and ruin the, the you know the whole fabric together something like that but by the same token if something is a real right. Uh, it should be extended everywhere. And, uh, you know, I be, I'm actually quite uncomfortable with the idea that, uh, okay, well, you know, uh, gays can get married in uh, New York, but then they're going to be uh, stoned to death in Pennsylvania or something like that. And it seems to me that on most fundamental issues, uh, you know, I, I don't particularly believe in the Constitution as a holy writ. And it's, you know, we have certain rights that are inalienable and they're not going to change. The most fundamental ones aren't going to change when you cross an arbitrary border between one of the 50 states. So. Um, well, let's uh, let's jump in and talk about the book here, Nick. Sure. Uh, that you and I wrote together. It's coming out on uh, Tuesday. Yeah. Um, or, well, on June 28th. And, on June 28th. Uh, and I think it's called the Declaration of Independence, How Libertarians Can Fix What's Wrong with America, How Libertarian Politics Can Fix What's Wrong. I found a copy of it on my desk when I came in here saying uh, uh, something like, to Matt, all the best, from John Chait. Oh, that's, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what so let me uh, let me start off by asking you why independence with a TS what what are they declaring what's the deal with a title what does it mean give us the elevator pitch of what the hell love is what is well we knew that we needed to have a uh, a bad pot in the title and I think mm -hmm. as we've discussed elsewhere that meet the Fockers was already taken so we went with the Declaration of Independence but you know the book in a in a very uh, quick way is about declaring independence in politics and also in declaring independence from politics and uh, we had been looking at how over the past 40 years and especially over the last decade uh, the growth of independence of people who refuse to identify with either the uh, you know the party of John Boehner or the party of Nancy Pelosi uh, has been growing I mean that that portion of the population and according to places like the Gallup poll and whatnot uh, these uh, independents are the single largest uh, voting bloc and they're increasingly important because they dictate the results of all the uh, all of major elections all statewide elections all national elections and we see that as a good thing because it means that people are thinking for themselves and just as they've given up on uh, kind of stupid or un, un, unwavering brand loyalty for gm or ford cars or chrysler you know they're also making uh the the major players in this industry of politics actually work for their votes which i think is a good thing but more importantly, uh, the uh, other thing that we uh, have observed over the past 40 years is how when you get away from the government, when the further you get away from industries or areas of our lives, activities that are not directly or indirectly controlled or heavily, heavily regulated by the government, 
things seem to be getting better. So when we, uh, you know, our food is much better, it's much more varied, it's much more interesting, there's much more innovation. Our uh, industry is much more interesting when you think about cyberspace, which was not really in any way created by the federal government, certainly. Uh, the early funding of the, uh, back, you know, the proto-internet is one thing, but it really came on scale when it was released from any kind of shackles having to do with the government. And then it, it's flourished into this fantastic space where, you know, a lot of people want to live, uh, you know, much of their life. And, you know, it's a great thing. Uh, you know, all around us, we see great innovation happening, except in the areas that are most directly and fundamentally controlled or heavily regulated by the government, such as K through 12 education, such as health care, such as retirement. So, you know, the book is an attempt to figure out what's going on and how can we bring the same level of uh, innovation, creative destruction, dynamism, personalization, that we see at the freaking Starbucks around the corner of the co uh, coffee shop uh, as we can. Uh, how, how do we bring that to bear in these areas that are still being kind of strangled and throttled by the political process? Uh, we talk, we have books in three parts, each of them uh, fairly distinct, and so we can use them as uh, discussion areas uh, here. Yeah. Uh, uh, most of the parts have uh, dreadful titles. Uh, can we blame you, or how does that work out? The, I, uh, I want to blame society. Okay. You want to blame Jerry Curlin? Yes, I would blame Jerry Curlin. Uh, but, and I do want to stick up for society because, as I understand it, you know, uh, uh, drugs didn't kill Letty Bruce. Society did. So yeah. score and, and one. Yeah, coming. Yes, yeah, score one for society. The only, uh, the only uh, sad thing is that it took so long. Uh, first part is called The End of the World as You Know It, which is, uh, I guess, the first REM song that you knew that their career was, was not going to be as satisfying as yes, so you right. originally had hoped. Um, but uh, it talks about uh, beyond duopoly, it talks about pursuing happiness, not politics, the pit and the pendulum, literary reference, and the uh, libertarian moment from a lot of what we are setting up at the beginning uh, and actually referencing back to that uh, original Declaration of Independence with the CE uh, is that the Declaration famously is not talking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of politics or the pursuit of the tingle up Chris Matthews's leg or whatever. It's the pursuit of happiness. There's uh, an inclination kind of right at the beginning, a source code as we use over and over uh, in the book, um, uh, saying that the stuff of value in life is um, the stuff that you're pursuing privately. It is the scope outside of government and you basically want freedom to pursue that as you see fit. Um, and the kind of beyond duopoly and, and, uh, and the pit and the pendulum, we're talking about the basic framework by which we all talk about politics on a day to day basis is as obfuscating and as unsatisfying uh, as it is anything else. If you, um, you know, if you're constantly worried about who is going to, in, you know, David Brooks's immortal phrase or anyone else's on, on the left, um, create a new permanent governing majority or a, a ruling majority that shall last for forever, yeah. um, I, uh, then you're missing the point. Uh, this is this is the game of basically two large brands that are sitting there and they, they are going to be sitting there for the foreseeable future, but when you step away from their momentary concerns, their semi-false and semi-true different kind of branding mechanism, oh, we're the party of limited government, the Republicans say, even though when they're in power, they goose the size of government by 60%. Or we're the party for civil liberties and free speech, the Democrats say, although we can't allow documentaries about politicians to be uh, broadcast. And as soon as Obama becomes elected, we're not going to give a flying tuckus, is that a word, uh, about uh, Guantanamo Bay or executive power or a bunch of other stuff. So if you pile away, if you stop that kind of tribal partisan theater, if you refuse to participate in there, suddenly the world looks like a more interesting place. There's a great and awful uh, study by Pew or one of these people that was quoted in the Ross Doubt Hat uh, column in the New York Times. Uh, basically, uh, two different uh, dates, 2005, 2009, same question uh, asked to Democrats and Republicans. 2005, you know, do you think that the government is a threat to you? And in 2005, 60% uh, of Republicans uh, or 60% of Democrats said, yes, the government is a threat. 
and just 20% of Republicans. And they asked the same exact question, same groups of people in 2009 when the Democrats ran everything. And of course, 60% of Republicans said the government is a threat and 20% uh, said that uh, Democrats said it was, which shows kind of the warping factors, the warping ideology of that tribalism. And we constantly in a libertarian space where we cross uh, o over these different lines, we're more on a, uh, it's not just a right-left axis, it's sort of an up and down and, uh, and uh, purple and pink uh, axis too. We are always trying to talk people out of that sense of tribalist loyalty. And when you when you stop thinking that the world that you live in is the world that you're always going to see for the rest of your life, uh, then uh, a new universe of possibilities kind of opens up. At, at any given time, you know, in, in early 1989, if you talk to a dissident in Eastern Europe, no one was talking about, oh yeah, communism is going to collapse next year or this year. Um, you know, if you talk to someone in 1971 when Richard Nixon issued wage and price controls and said, oh yeah, we're going to end the military draft by mid-decade, and uh, and also Jimmy Carter and Ralph Nader and Teddy Kennedy are going to band together with liberal academics to end the regulation of airlines and trucking. They would have thought that you were a plum loco. Right. So a lot of what we're trying to do is, you know, the things actually get better a lot faster than you imagine. And what we imagine is the status quo at any given time um, as you know duopolies that have uh, that have eternal control over our actions. Uh, actually, as soon as individuals figure out how to control their own power, how to work around these institutions, then suddenly they can dissolve very quickly. So it's sort of a palate cleanser, beginning of the book, uh, setting up your mind for, hey, you know, things can change a lot quicker than you think. And actually, we can argue that in the last 10 years especially, uh, Americans more and more have found ways to affect things uh, outside of the realm of politics. How to affect politics by being on the outside of it. Um, let's talk a little bit, and you can uh, tee this up. The second part, yep. the uh, democratization of just about everything, or case studies in making life richer, weirder, and better. This is, uh, in many ways, the meat of the book. What are we talking about, uh, Nick uh, Gillespie? Yeah, well, I, you know, uh, this uh, proceeds from a kind of longstanding uh, sensibility that I've, I've always, you know, kind of participated in. Or I, I would think about, uh, you know, life uh, case studies of making life richer, weirder, and better. And, uh, you know, I, I used to marvel when we would start going into grocery stores, and this really started happening in the early part of this decade, although it was there in the 90s, but when you would go into the produce section and you would suddenly see something you had never seen before and it would have a sticker on it. It was like a, you know, a vegetable, some kind of gourd or fruit. And it would have a sticker on it that even told you what it was and how the hell to eat the goddamn thing. And it's like, you know, uh, that's pretty damn great, you know, that we, you know, it just started happening. And it didn't just happen. It's because of a relaxation of certain types of trade laws because people get tired of the same old shit. I mean, like how many times can you eat a white potato and then suddenly you want a blue potato or a red skin potato or, you know, a brocca flower and then you don't just want a cross between regular green broccoli and regular white cauliflower, but you want orange and purple and fuchsia and you know, everything. And, uh, you know, it's this is the type of thing that's been going on and it's been going on not because we are uh, being told what to do, but rather because power, uh, top-down power has receded from those areas. And, uh, you know, that's what the meat of the book absolutely is. It's about how we, how in so many parts of our lives, we are doing better when you think about stuff over the past 40 years, which we use as a benchmark for reasons that are more made more clear in the book. Um, but, you know, we, we are able to mongrelize ourselves, hybridize ourselves, mix ourselves in ways that are genuinely um, terrifying to a lot of people and anxiety inducing, but also incredibly liberating in, in terms of, you know, we were started off talking about gay marriage. I mean, you know, you, you go back to the late 80s, for God's sake, and, you know, there's still like Tinkerbell jokes being made about gay people. Uh, you know, uh, there's, uh, you know, a tension about racial discourse, which is still real in America and is still, uh, you know, it, we're not at the end of any of these roads, but it's just so much better now. And uh, I mean, Stonewall happened when? In 69? Yes, or, that's or right. 70? Yes. I mean, in New York City, uh, you could just like, beat holy shit out of a bunch of gay people because they they all all being right. gay 
Yeah. Uh, you know, which is which is totally unimaginable. Well, and uh, you know, you pointed out in the, uh, I believe you turned up this nugget of how uh, you know Griswold versus Connecticut, the uh, '66 case about birth control in a, within the context of a married couple being denied it or, or whatever by state law, and it led to the uh, kind of the first articulation of the right of privacy that then was used in Roe versus Wade, and you can, you know, whatever the legal arguments are, but it was only in the early 70s that it became legal, legally acceptable for women who were not married to be, to get prescriptions for the birth control pill. I mean, we have come a phenomenally long way, you know, from that girl and the Mary Tyler Moore show to Sex in the City and things like that. And the, the immensity of the cultural liberation as well as the commercial liberation so that we have mashups and we have technology and we have ways of reconfiguring ourselves and our experience pretty much as we see it. I mean, this was a big theme for me back in the 90s uh, at Reason when I started writing about things that we ended up calling the culture boom or cultural chaos, where it just it's become easier to produce and consume all sorts of culture and all sorts of identity and all sorts of lifestyle experiments. It's become easier to consume and produce those in, a, in an increasingly varied uh, set of uh, circumstances. And that's all great. And it freaks people out just like it freaked people out in the 17th century when all of a sudden, you know, in England, uh, a state religion went bye bye and people, you know, and all sorts of religions started breaking out. They were the rock of flowers of their day and people were flipped out. We're actually handling the change a lot better. And that, you know, in, in, uh, in the book, uh, in section two, Matt, I think it's worth talking about, you know, we, we talk about how the workplace has changed and it's better now and how gender relations and personal identities are richer, how the media has become more variegated. Uh, and that's all fantastic. But I mean, I think it's worth pointing out, you know, in, in a chapter that you're largely responsible for, you are now free to move about the country, which is about the deregulation of airline trucking, beer making. Uh, you know, talk. I think it's worth talking about how there are better or worse rules that can be in place, so maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's. I'm fascinated by various ways in which groups, of, especially political groups in this country, rewrite their own history or make their own history. Um, you know this more than I do, or maybe Jesse Walker, a managing editor, knows it best. But you know, for instance, uh, the Christian right or the group whatever sort of uh, organized evangelical politics weren't that exercised about abortion in the mid 70s uh, uh, it, that became politics kind of a little bit later which is uh, very strange and there's a, and this replicates in a lot of different ways and, and a part that we talk about a lot in the book is how uh, Democrats have kind of scrubbed their cultural institutional and even policy, uh, anti-authoritarianism um, it's a curiosity uh, you it, the 1970s uh, late 60s and early 70s is a in, incredibly um, you know kind of wonderful uh, and terrifying period in our culture that a lot of people celebrate and, and uh, others uh, uh, sort of trash I tend to uh, enjoy a lot uh, in our culture and back then if you just looked at any kind of Hollywood movie the three, the three days of the condor and the conversation, all this kind of stuff. There was some serious paranoia. The mainstream uh, kind of uh, left progressive take, it, it, although it wasn't called progressive back then, was openly hostile to uh, actually the mainstream left progressive take. I mean, David Halverson was writing the best of the brightest, not as a critique of Republicans, but as a critique of this organization, organization man, kind of managerial technocratic nightmare. Um, and I think both you and I have taken a lot of sort of journalistic yeah. inspiration or comportmental inspiration from people who self-identified on the left back then and who are objectively anti-authoritarian. Uh, airline deregulation is a, a we come to it a lot because it's really the first main example of a policy deregulation that happened, and also uh, you know it, it's intertwined with the history of Reason Magazine. Yeah. Bob Poole who uh, remains uh, uh, on our board of trustees and does a lot of great transportation research, one of the best transportation analysts in the country, if not the best. Um, he wrote a cover story way back when, in 1969, 1970, uh, about uh, deregulating what, what it would be like if we released um, this corporatist control that existed at the time of the airline market. Basically, from the late 30s to the early 70s, the same four companies 
dominated with almost the same exact market share uh, of the airline industry. And if you wanted to do something crazy like, hi, I'm an airline, I would like to exist, and I would like to fly between you know, Dallas and San Antonio, you had to apply for approval from the government who would never give it to you. Uh, you had to prove that uh, that this line was being underserved. Um, your, your rates that you wanted to sell it for had to be approved. What you served on board as a meal had to be approved. Yeah. It's insane when you think about it. And at the time, you had people like the great liberal uh, uh, economist, Alfred, Alfred Kahn, saying, hey, look, you know what? We hate uh, here on the, on the economic left, we hate um, uh, concentrated monopolies. And this is a government uh, forced monopoly. He, he used kind of antitrust ideas to look at how this might uh, affect in the world's regulation. And, and he was smart enough to realize that antitrust legislation, actually, or the cartel arrangements were not done um, against the wishes of the big big corporate players, but actually was in the in the service of them, so that it was, that was the problem, having the rate boards, having the oversight, that that's actually what allowed, that was the infrastructure that allowed uh, TWA and United and Pan Am and, uh, you know, whatever to control the industry, and so, yeah, he made a strong case to get away from it. I love the stuff, I mean, talk a bit about Herb Kelleher, because he's, you know, Bob Poole is the, uh, you know, he's the policy muscle and then Herb Kelleher, the uh, the head of Southwest Air, who you interviewed for the book, and I think it's just a fantastic character. You know, what what's his reaction, and how does he play into? Uh, He's a, he was a knee slapping knee slapping uh, good old boy or, or adopted good old boy. He's actually from the Northeast, but he uh, relocated to Texas in the '60s and considered himself a John Connolly Democrat. Um, and he was the lawyer to an upstart airline. He was sort of a, a lawyer who was doing. Uh, mergers and acquisitions and kind of entrepreneurial stuff. And he uh, became Southwest lawyer. And Southwest was, uh, before it could fly a single flight, it had to fight nearly five years of legal battles, including all the way up to the Supreme Court, at every step of the way. And was that, it, was that just inside Texas, or was it, uh, I mean, or they, they had flights, as long as you were within Texas, Yes, you had uh, more, the, more flexibility, but then it's once interstate travel. That right, was, you still needed national uh, approval to exist, right. uh, and then after the national approval to exist, you needed state approval to fly in between points in a state. Right, um, and so Southwest in Texas and PSA in California became the first two real kind of low cost airlines, and they could fly within the state. I mean, right. they. They, they, the states were big enough that there was finally a, a, able to be kind of a laboratory for what happens when you introduce competition right. and you relax the rules. Um, he basically, at, at some point, uh, he became CEO of the company because they kept fighting all these legal battles and they were running out of money. And he just basically, <laughs> basically said, you know what, um, I'll pay if I lose this one. And if I win, you know, make me a CEO or, right. or you know, uh, give me some stake. Uh, he became this great swashbuckling uh, CEO of the company. And their whole idea is, I mean, it's its not an accident that their slogan is, you are now free to move about the country. They talk about democratizing air travel. And at the time that they first started air travel was, I mean, you see, look, look at movies when you see people uh, uh, traveling by air in the 60s even. I mean, your suit and tie, it was a rich person's thing. It was a big deal. And Southwest said, you know, no, this should be available to, you know, people wearing sweatpants and sneakers yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and not having the same kind of manners. It should be available to everybody. And they finally won enough legal battles. And then uh, beginning in the Ford administration and then the Carter administration, there was finally a movement that, again, was led by Teddy Kennedy right. uh, in many ways and his trusted assistant, Stephen Breyer, who now is a liberal yeah, Supreme yeah. Court justice, um, that they recognized that the authority that so many on the left were uh, rebelling against, the authorities, the Robert McNamara's of the world, who were prosecuting the Vietnam War, uh, uh, this sort of institutional, uh, you know, uh, Time Magazine, Walter Cronkite kind of mm -hmm. top-down world, they, they were sick of that world, and they recognized it for what it is, as concentrations of power that needed to be challenged. And so they created this kind of deregulatory moment, and Herb Kelleher was sort of the, uh, the great uh, test case, the foot in the door, of let's let's I will give you a demonstration project if you give me at least enough freedom to go out there 
and he was advertising, you know, with with uh, uh, you know, you, you know, have your free fifth of Chivas if you right. fly yeah. between these places. And they became the most profitable airline in the world, right. and have been almost from their inception. Always keeping in mind that we're about democratization. We want to bring air travel to people who haven't had it before, and we will be just militant about uh, keeping prices low, turning around planes, right. and having this whole kind of uh, 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 low-key, uh, non, uh, not putting on airs type of right. uh, effect on things like that. So. Uh, the players that and, and, and when this uh, deregulation happened and, and, and more entrants came in, it became much more turbulent. A lot of people went bankrupt. A lot of new things started up. But the most important thing is that prices fell like a stone right. uh, and air travel and the number of people who went in the air just it like doubled within five, ten years. It's, it's an astonishing uh, thing of growth. And it's amazing to me. This deregulation now is a word that has become associated chiefly with like Ronald Reagan right. and Margaret Thatcher, um, and it's necessary for uh, Democrats right now, and necessary and wrong, I think, um, to just scrub that from the history. And then like it is that that uh, of course a Democrat should be for big government. Well, that's not what Democrats were saying in the '70s. So right. part of our book is to celebrate people who are democratizing and point out that they were unusual people. They weren't necessarily the people who you might ex uh, expect yeah. uh, be the ones to lead these these decentralizations of power, these uh, devolutions of authority more towards the individual and away from some kind of central uh, gatekeeper. Do you remember, uh, I, uh, just to uh, walk back to history, uh, the first time I flew, I think it was like 1970 or 71, my parents uh, took uh, my brother and sister and I on a vacation and we actually flew from New Jersey from Newark Airport to uh, Dulles Airport in D.C. for reasons that escaped me on Braniff. But uh, because uh, we, you know, we got the full treatment, like for years I had a Braniff uh, tote bag, you know, that they, you know, they just gave you one because every ticket was, I mean, there was first class, but coach was pretty sweet and extremely expensive. So, yeah. Uh, uh, and, and then it know, was People's Airline and Laker Airlines, et cetera, in the, uh, by the late 70s had started creeping in in the early 80s and had made it like flying, uh, you know, taking the bus in the air, which you still hear people, inevitably, uh, liberals like uh, Robert Kuttner of uh, the American Prospect writes a column every, uh, every time his plane is delayed five minutes or he can't get his uh, crappy piece of flame and yawn cooked wrong. On a transcontinental flight, he's always bitching and moaning about how you know how horrible air and air travel is now because the the flights are crowded and you know there are all sorts of people uh, you know shoving into the uh, fuselage or something. If you go to Europe, uh, you can basically fly from England certainly to anywhere or the UK to anywhere for basically the price of the taxes on the ticket if you reserve it well in advance. There are hundreds. Of low-cost airlines, it's completely changed even the culture uh, of uh, of Europe in, in ways that are hard to uh, hard to totally wrap your minds around. And sadly, America, which led the world in this kind of deregulation, has now fallen behind. We still won't let Richard Branson own 51 percent of an airline. I uh, don't you think that's payback for him? Uh, you know, uh, uh, back bankrolling Mike Oldfield's uh, recording career, Tubular Bells, and Hershey's yeah. Bridge. I, I don't. But I, I mean, there's a statute of limitations yeah. on prog rock. I think yeah. uh, most prog rock, not all of it, uh, that uh, we can we can find that out. And uh, yeah, no, but it's can... it's it's a shame because uh, you know, and again, it's you know, we live uh, to quote the uh, maestro Bob Dylan, we live in a political world, but. It's important, and I think you know part of part of our book is that you can actually have more political impact, not by you know saying okay, I'm team blue, I'm team red, whatever, but by pushing for the issues that matter and that will to you and to your group, and will actually expand democratization and decentralization and the air deregulation, along with truck interstate trucking deregulation, interstate freight handling on railroads, all of which went along in the same thing with the Nader Kennedy. Carter uh, uh, kind of combo. It's uh, it's a shame that that now is fictitiously uh, or erroneously ascribed to Republicans who haven't been interested in deregulating uh, squat anyway, and now we're stuck with these bullshit national rules of like it. It's a threat to national security to have Richard Branson of all people 
you know, getting to uh, run a domestic, an airline that flies domestic flights. It's, it's just, well, let's talk a little bit about that, like uh, putting this stuff into practice. The last yeah. section of the book is uh, infamously titled uh, Operationalize It, Baby, yeah. um, which probably should be uh, and, uh, done. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, note to uh, people just starting out. Don't put placeholders in place yeah, no. because oftentimes they'll end up being the actual title. So, um, um, But this is where we talk yeah. a lot both in – the abstract and the nitty gritty about, all right, so there's been these democratizations, there is this kind of fluid moment that we live in, uh, tell us how we, we dig out of the hole and, and apply this stuff. Uh, so Nick, you, um, you took the serious policy guy's hat on, uh, certainly at the, um, in this uh, section, talking about uh, K through 12 education and other things. Right. Talk us through a little bit about how you would impose or, or transfer these types of, of thoughts on these vexing policy issues that are uh, really kind of haunting us right now. Well, uh, you know, and this is uh, largely through uh, work that I've done uh, with a frequent collaborator, Eric Durushi of uh, Reason, who writes a, a economics column for Reason and works at the Mercatus Center at George Mason. But we had started looking at various kinds of funding problems or uh, deficit problems at the national level, state level, city level. And, you know, the, the pretext of all of this is it's a combination of ideas and having good ideas out there in circulation, but also, you know, major, major problems. I mean, the federal government is screwed in terms of massive deficits that are not going away anytime soon and accumulated national debt. Every state in the country has serious issues, uh, some probably terminal, I mean, in terms of uh, places like Illinois, massive, massive shortfalls, and most cities, most municipalities are also screwed. And so they know they need to be trying something different, uh, which is the beginning point of really uh, having an opportunity to change things or to look at the ways in which we can do things differently. Uh, and then, you know, so that's an essential starting point. And then when you look at things like K through 12 education, there is in fact, you know, 90% or thereabouts of uh, students go to conventional, traditional public schools where you go based on your address, where, you know, whether it's, a, you know, a grammar school or a middle school or a high school. Uh, but there are an increasing number of people uh, who are going to other types of schools that basically try to give individuals a certain amount of money and then they can take that money wherever they go. And whether it's a charter school or a voucher program or people staying at home and doing online learning, which where they get a certain amount of money from the state or whatever. But, uh, you know, what happens is that when you give people the, the actual consumers of a good, more ability to make smart the choices they think are smart you develop a flourishing uh, ecosystem and this is starting to happen the berlin wall uh, of tearing down the public school monopoly is slowly happening but like all of these things when it, it when it finally hits that tipping point and it might be at 85 percent or 80 percent of students uh, being in traditional schools and then it's going to crack open uh, you're, you know, we're seeing more and more school districts interested in strapping money to the backs of kids where they get to choose because they know that that creates a more responsive and more innovative system that in the end, not only whether or not it costs less, it actually satisfies its chief consumers better. Uh, and similar things can be done in retirement. Certainly things should be done in healthcare where, uh, you know, education is one of these places where it's very easy to understand that since 1970 and the, uh, according to the government's own stats, we're spending over two times as much per pupil in an inflation adjusted dollars. The results, again, by government standards are flat or dropping at best. Uh, and that's, you know, that's just unacceptable. We would not put up with it. Nobody, nobody's paying twice as much in real dollars for their car, for a car that is only as good as, the, you know, the 19, 1970 Chevy Impala that I was driving in the 1980s or anything like that. We would not put up with it. And there's no reason that we have to in the political arena. Uh, and that also goes for healthcare, where the, the major problem with healthcare and with healthcare spending has to do with the almost absolute lack of clear market signals because we're not paying, you know, as, as the consumer, we're not paying our bills. If we're the insurer, we're not, it's not our cancer that we're saying, hey, you know what, you, you, you know, just uh, put some ice on it, baby. Uh, and, and if we're the employer, we're not, you know, we're, we don't care. We're not, we're, we don't care. I mean, the, the, the pricing signals, the, the market mechanisms in healthcare totally screwed up. 
and there are easy ways to uh, kind of decentralize the decision making to the actual players who are in the transaction. So, and then of course, Matt, I think, uh, you know, and this is actually quite possibly the more revolutionary part of the book, which is an analysis that you brought to bear, uh, which is that, you know, we have to get past this great man theory or this great woman theory of politics of if we only get the right people in place and like, oh, you know, Lord Obama will save us or Sarah Palin will descend from the cloud. She kicked Mary being assumed body and soul into heaven off of if she levitates back down to the scrum of politics, we'll be OK. And I mean, you know, you invert a phrase that David Brooks and others have talked about and, and you know, search after like Ponce de Leon looking for the fountain of youth, you know, the permanent governing majority to talk about how what we really are in and are going to be in. And it's a good thing to be in an era of permanent non-governing minorities. So I would, yeah. uh, you know, talk about the swarm effect here. It's a, it's a, a wonderfully uh, uh, inelegant phrase, but uh, it's accurate, damn it. Um, no, I mean, I, I think that you could argue that even beginning in 2000, if you want to, uh, looking at the Nader campaign, which I was one of the only reporters stupid enough to cover, um, but uh, more specifically, basically from 2004 on, with the Howard Dean anti-war movement, every basically two years in this country right now, there exists from seemingly, or there shows up from seemingly out of nowhere, uh, a new like movement in politics where, where people, and especially young people, are super fired up. Especially young people, but not only young people, quite a lot of older people, or people who were uh, in kind of non-traditional uh, politics, become completely fired up, usually about a single issue. Uh, Howard Dean's was very much uh, centered around the war. Um, and they will immediately become the best people in politics currently who, uh, in terms of using the Internet, uh, su surprisingly. And it doesn't depend on age. It depends on marginalization. Uh, once your issue is not being concerned, dealt with uh, by the party that you normally affiliate with and certainly by the uh, opposing party, you get angry. You band together with people who believe uh, in a similar thing. And you change the shape of politics. We have it. We see it happening right now since late 2008 with the Tea Party. Um, they appeared seemingly out of nowhere. They have been confounding everyone's attempts to define them, um, except for the people who actually listen to what they say, which is far too difficult for a lot of uh, analysts. Um, they show up out of nowhere. They're really, really clever about using the internet. And they demonstrably have impacted politics to the point where there are a lot of, finally in 2010, people who are at least semi-affiliated with the Tea Party are influenced by the same concerns, which is a very consistent anti-big government, anti-Obamacare, anti-deficit and debt uh, a set of, uh, of issues. This is going to be with us from here on out. I think, I mean, we talk about the long trend since 1970, of independence. Basically, if you look at Harris Poll, independence have grown from like 19% in 70 to around 28, 30% uh, since then. They are now the largest uh, group, especially in the last 10 years this is going. But if you look at the, uh, the who are these independents now compared to the last time that these kind of peaked out, which was in the early 90s. Early 90s, it was all about Ross Perot. Right. So Ross Perot, his ears, his charts, and then it kind of trickled down from there, and he excited people. Let's follow this guy. Uh, independents right now are following nobody. Tea Party famously has nobody in charge of it. The media uh, periodically tries to anoint Sarah Palin or you know Roy Moore or God knows who what uh, to be the uh, uh, the uh, the grand poobah of it. But there is no leader of the Tea Party, uh, which terrifies people. But I think uh, shows uh, persistent strength. And if you look at the difference uh, between the Howard Dean movement and the Tea Party movement, I think it's very instructive, and activists going forward on any issue that is being disrespected by their party and the other party will follow this model and not the Howard Dean anti-war model. After the 2004 election, Howard Dean was elected chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Um, and so they wanted to subsume his infrastructure, moveon.org, you know, which is a super grassroots group. It's now a super, like, Democrat uh, a coalition group that is busy like mucking around with net neutrality and yeah. God knows what. It just doesn't one. matter in the same way for sure that it did even a couple of years ago because they're absolutely you know, does not. And whereas the Tea Party 
never got absorbed into the Republican Party. The Republican Party would love to do the same thing. Yeah. Come on in, you know, you're part of the, the whole team. But the Tea Party famously, uh, you know, intervened in a few elections, including backing an independence instead of a Republican, backing crazy people instead of an electable Republican. If you aligned with their views on, on spending, especially, and on the Trouble Assets Relief Program and a bunch of other stuff, bailout economics, they could forgive a lot. And uh, they are routinely pilloried for this. And I think that misses a point. The point is that when you show that you actually care about your issue more than your party, um, that makes your that party panic yeah. and much more likely to to uh, absorb your concerns and take them seriously. Where is the anti-war movement right now? It's well, country. and you know uh, what's uh, so particularly sad about Howard Dean's uh, you know pathetic uh, kind of absorption into the uh, power structures. It's the oldest. I was in Boy Scouts, and that was like uh, when I became a patrol leader or a troop leader or something. You know, the scoutmaster uh, said, uh, you know, the best thing to do with a troublemaker is you give them a role that has responsibility in it. And then they, you know, they, they fall right into line and they become company men. And that's essentially what happened to Dean. And I hope it doesn't happen to the Tea Party, obviously. Uh, you know, the only real difference between like John Boehner and Dennis Hastert is, you know, uh, the former Speaker of the House as, uh, you know, I guess he was the uh, Joe Altabelli to uh, Newt Gingrich's uh, uh, Earl, Will uh, Earl Weaver. But, you know, it was about 50 pounds and the Tea Party. Because John Boehner, who was my congressman in, in Ohio, where I actually uh, vote and pay taxes, you know, the only thing, the only reason why he isn't a complete shill for the status quo is because he's worried about losing his m majority. And the Tea Party has shown that they can elect and de-elect a lot of people in the last midterms. Yeah, uh, and I think going forward, you know, it, it, our book is not a, uh, uh, you know, a cheerleading rally for the Tea Party. Uh, you know, we hope to inspire people from, uh, from any walk of the political spectrum. If your team, or hopefully you don't even have a team, but if your issue is being disrespected and if there is a, uh, a large number of people who agree with you about this issue, um, the way to pursue it is, out, is outside of the normal channels of politics. Uh, I uh, would predict that the next place that we'll see this on is the drug war, an issue that a lot of libertarians certainly care about and a lot of liberals and progressives care about. Right. Uh, we have a lot of young people come to the office, and whenever you ask them, why did you vote for Barack Obama, um, it usually comes down to kind of issues of tolerance talk about gay marriage, like, oh, he must be better than Republicans on gay marriage. Um, and it talks about the drug war and these kinds of social issues in which tangibly uh, he and the Democrats have traditionally been very, very worthless right. all this time. And on uh, the drug war, it's particularly galling because, of course, he said, I inhaled, and that was the point, and all this. He makes jokes about right. about it when his own base asks him you know, questions at town hall meetings. Hey, so uh, what do you think about legalizing marijuana, maybe taxing it and using the savings and then the new taxes to help address the budget? He's like, ah, ha, ha, Internet stoners. Um, that's not funny. Yeah. I mean, it's 850,000 people getting arrested every year for this shit, and there's no reason to accept that. And if you look all around the country, there is a medical marijuana movement in now 16, 17 states that have legalized this and allowed at least some kind of foot in the door here, some workaround. That exists because, in my opinion, the Internet. It exists because there is a way to organize politically now outside of the power structures and to pass ballot initiatives and to you know never ex expect a damn thing from any elected politician with a couple of exceptions. Barney Frank is one of them. Ron yeah. Paul is one of them. Gary Johnson is one of them. But otherwise, make your own reality and you know use the citizen initiative pro process and the internet to create your own reality. And you know we had in 2010 the first real chance at a legalization initiative in the state of California, uh, and it got close enough. And this is a fascinating thing because drug policy activists were against it. I mean, the traditional groups that are trying to legalize marijuana were like, oh, this is too soon. Yeah. But people got fed up. They wanted to work around it. And, you know, let's, let's go through the front door. Enough of these workarounds, enough of these yeah. kind of backdoor initiatives. Let's ask for freedom in the front door. And it got, uh, got 46.5% of the vote. It got it did uh, pretty well, and there will be initiatives on a couple of states at least 
in 2012, California again, most likely Colorado and Nevada. And now we have for the first time on the floor of the House of Representatives the Frank uh, Paul bill to uh, to legalize or get the federal government out of criminalizing uh, marijuana. That issue is not going to be led by Democratic politicians. If you are a Democrat out there and you're thinking, you know, I'm going to get what I want by electing, I'm going to end the drug war by electing Democratic politicians, you got to grow up. It's yeah. not happening. Obama has been awful raiding medical marijuana establishments after saying that he wouldn't. He spends more money on the drug war than George W. Bush. Hey, does he's ter he's it. terrible on illegal immigration. I mean, he's deported more people than Bush. Yeah, he's a, he's a bum. I mean, he's a, he's a very. I mean, or if you like George Bush, you should love Barack Obama, which is a sad state for those of us who uh, would rather pass and be our own presidents. Uh, you know, I mean, look at that, that. What Hillary Clinton said in Jamaica this week when. Uh, you know, you have to ask yourself when it comes to the Libya war, yeah. uh, whose side are you on? Yeah. I mean, it's as if they're rubbing our faces in it at right. this point. Oh, you voted against George W. Bush because he said you were with us or with the terrorists. Well, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, what a aren't simplistic uh, black and white, uh, you know, mentally deficient view, uh, way of viewing the world. But, uh, Matt, I want to, before we run out of time, I do want to uh, challenge you on, uh, uh, you know, at least one big thing. We, in the book, we have a chapter, uh, because we are clearly stuck in music that is very old and was never really that good to begin with, but we name a chapter after a Neil Young song, Keep on Rocking in the Free World, which is a... Uh, kind of funny, uh, from his Freedom album that was released in 1989, only a couple of weeks before the Berlin Wall collapsed, but where he's mocking George H.W. Bush and America for being reactionary, and he's talking about rocking in the free world. But in that, um, you know, you, you talk about, and there's no question, I, I mean, we talk about it, this is really a, uh, a co-authored book, but about how the cultural role that the that rock music or that American popular culture, Western popular culture played in uh, in bringing down authoritarian regimes around the world, and certainly Soviet communism. But what what do you think the role is in, you know, there's no question that that's true. I mean, and it, you know, and I think it was our uh, former colleague, Charles Paul Freund, read a great line in a piece once where he said, you know, the problem with the Soviet Union wasn't that it couldn't produce enough tanks, it was that it couldn't produce enough Levi's. Um, there's no question that the cultural dimension is huge, but is it just a coincidence that the Berlin Wall collapsed after a you know fifty years of massive military buildup and having you know hundreds of thousands of uh, Pershing missiles and other you know armaments pointed towards the Soviet Union? What's what's the role of hard power versus soft power? I guess, and you know as we we talk about this in terms of the Middle East and about Islamism and whatnot, you know, part of it, I, I don't support any of the interventions that we've done over the long haul here at all. I think they're mistaken, but it's, you know, what's the role of military power in keeping the peace as well as, or, or spreading, uh, spreading freedom? Uh, from I think, I think the hard power question is much different looking at the Cold War uh, than looking at our current post-Cold War mo moment, and particularly the Arab Spring uh, in general. There really was a superpower confrontation. It played out in a lot of proxy civil wars. It played out literally with borders in Europe and missiles on either side of them. It was real, um, and you cannot discount it. I would. Uh, we talk a lot about Václav Havel, who's a big uh, hero of mine in the book, and and the kind of uh, the treatment in the chapter talks about this strange voyage by which the Velvet Underground, the great junkie band from New York, ended up impacting in a fundamental way, um, and through a lot of weird streams, um, Hobbles, a bit, you know, whole organization about being a, a dissident and starting Charter 77, which itself became this replicating kind of source code for dissent. It democratized dissent in many ways and gave it a, 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 an avenue, not just in all throughout Eastern Europe, but now in China and Cuba and uh, the Arab Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and so, yeah, culture played a huge role there and was important. And he will talk about that and loves that. Uh, and he, whenever as president, there was any, you know, uh, a shitty rocker coming through town, he, you know, Pink Floyd or the remnants of Pink Floyd would waddle through and he'd make sure to go out and have a beer with them um, because he always saw that culture and especially kind of 60s authentic or, you know, uh, uh, youth culture being mm. fundamental in his conceptions of freedom. All that's true, but the same Havel will also write in an essay that I commend everyone to read 
called An Anatomy of Reticence. It was written like in the mid to late 80s. And it was basically an open hate letter to the Western peace movement uh, because he felt they were disproportionately uh, whinging about missiles being, Reagan's missiles being uh, planted on Western German soil um, at a time when the Soviet Union was busy, you know, trying to eradicate Afghanistan from the map, um, which would never uh, otherwise come up by the same Western peace activists. And he kind of put it, you know, I look at people who um, always emphasize this thing over here while ignoring actual, uh, you know, aggressive, violent uh, activity. You know, this just fills me with endless sorrow or, or yeah. some such. Um, he certainly recognized hard power or, or it's, you know, thought that hard power was, was very important uh, at the time. And I, I don't think that you can say uh, you can assign exact numerical figures on it. Certainly the Soviet Union felt like in the 80s, and this is reflected in their negotiating points through all of uh, Gorbachev and Reagan uh, kind of discussions, that uh, American military spending was something that they were trying desperately to catch up with and couldn't or right. knew it somehow. Um, so that definitely affected things. But it also affected things that, you know, the economies in each one of these countries, and, and uh, uh, Russia in particular, was uh, Soviet Union in particular, which is terrible. And, and the more that you were able to see the outside world through satellite television, you know, someone sitting in Bratislava, you live, you live uh, uh, 25, 35 miles away from Vienna, yeah. you can watch Austrian television, and it is a daily damning indictment of your, I mean, it, it, is, it is like the word lie and being you, put on your government. Yeah, and you have to, I mean, when the Austrians are seen as like, you know, footloose <laughs> and crazy, uh, you know, an added uh, threat to the regime, you know, you know that you're, yeah. pretty, you're pretty buttoned down. But, uh, you know, translating that in the modern world is totally different because you don't have an expansionary, weaponized, uh, you know, binary threat uh, looking down at us. We don't have anything like that. We are unchallenged in the world in many ways, and, and, we're, uh, and we're trying to make this analogy with Middle East, and uh, certainly George W. Bush tried, uh, tried like crazy to the point where you're starting up a Radio Free Europe-like um, uh, radio stations in the in the Arab Middle uh, Middle East, which you know uh, actually did not learn the lessons of Radio Free Europe at all. But uh, and it, the analogy completely breaks down because there's no longer a superpower challenge. Um, you know the you can't where are you going to station the missile? It just doesn't it doesn't make sense. So my long winded answer is that you can't just say it was only rock and roll. It, you know rock and roll is crucial and it works in ways that are totally unpredictable fascinating and fun on some level and, and in ways that confound American domestic politics, yeah. let alone uh, far-flung politics, uh, but you can't uh, attribute it solely to that. Um, we're almost out of time, but uh, I, uh, I do want to challenge you. Uh, over there on your desk, there is a, um, a G.G. Allen doll, a bobblehead doll, um, uh, which is uh, bad enough, frankly. <laughs> But uh, you know you're a you're a a famous uh, nihilist yes. former lifeguard who used to smear pellets of human excrement on your skin uh, in the uh, summertime. I uh, think uh, somehow you're misremembering. It wouldn't be the yeah. first time that you completely misreported something. But continue. yeah, uh, Chris, but no, you you, uh, you are are not known for your sunny disposition, and yet yeah. this book has a uh, uh, we're com we're always accused of being uh, optimists. <laughs> By the likes of John Stossel, yeah. uh, so like, how can a uh, how can someone as uh, as desperately sad as you uh, uh, be optimistic? Well, or are I, you just lying? You know, uh, no. I mean, and and I think that this is uh, part of it. I have a very strong sense of uh, you know, kind of recent history. Uh, like a lot of people in America, I mean, my family's past in this country only dates back to sometime in the 19 teens, I guess. All four of my grandparents came over. Uh, from Ireland and Italy, and uh, it's, you know, and I, I, just as a side note, we don't even know where my Italian grandfather started out because he came over and he worked in some uh, rock quarry where he was sledging rock by hand with a bunch of other guidos, uh, and they wouldn't tell, they, he never learned to speak English, but uh, they wouldn't tell him where they were because then they figured, they, you know, that's the first step to breaking out of the place and, you know, getting out of, you know, a really crappy, uh, you know, basically indentured servant. 
uh, situation. So, like, you know, my roots in the country are pretty, not only pretty recent, but they're also pretty uh, shallow. I mean, we don't know where the hell the guy was for the first year and a half of his uh, time in the U.S. But, um, and, and through that, it's also my parents, I mean, they were born in the 20s, they grew up during the Depression, and they ended up doing fabulously well compared to what they started out with. I have done so much better than them, and I think that my kids, who are 17 and about to turn 10, are going to do much better than me. And, you know, part of the book, we look at the intergenerational increases in wealth and mobility and fluidity in class terms, and surprisingly enough, to most or for most people, it would be surprising, things are going pretty well. So I, there is no question that, like, I have a dark uh, sense of humor, and I have a, uh, I like sad songs, I like uh, books that make you want to, uh, you know, just put a bullet in your head and all of that type of stuff. But, you know, objectively, I mean, this it's a luxury good. The type of, uh, you know, kind of existential despair that we can wrestle with is, is a luxury good. It doesn't exist in a world without kind of, uh, you know, time on our hands. And things have been getting better. I mean, you know, we can joke about the, the fruits and vegetables at a produce section, but for God's sake, I mean, you know, part of me thinks that, you know, the fact that uh, Americans are obese now where they were, you know, skinny is unbelievable. You know, we all look like Frank Sinatra 25, 40 years ago, and now we're all fat loads. Like, you know, that's that's progress on some level. And it's most important, it's progress in terms of, you know, of all of the things that matter. I mean, like, God, you know, think about it. I have cousins uh, who could not admit to their parents that they were gay, much less get married or live openly. And it's like, that day is over. And that's that's great. I have friends who have been, uh, you know, who are in interracial couples that even 30 years ago would have been much tougher than, say, 50 years ago or, you know, when Barack Obama's parents met. I mean, the world is becoming a better place. And, you know, and then on trivial levels, and we've talked about this in the past, I used to be into weird bands, and not even weird bands. I was, I got into the birds when I was in high school because I heard one of their songs once and I was like, oh, that sounds cool. And it was impossible to get any information, like even a discography, much less who was in the band at any given time and when you go online now or you go other places like you have this wealth of information of opportunities of options of possibilities that just literally didn't exist yesterday much less 30 or 40 years ago and i have to believe that the you know the the, the juice the passion the creativity the ability of humans to wrap around shit in you know in human history and in evolutionary history and political history is pretty inspiring and that we're going to be better off in the next five years much less the next 50 years well that was just a you know i i'm uh i'm ready to go outside and and uh and, and kick somebody in, in the leg with happiness yeah. uh no that's uh that's uh awesome and inspiring and a good enough uh, note to uh end this so uh let's not mend this let's end this let's end this uh not mend this the book is the declaration of independence how libertarian politics can fix what's wrong with America. My name is Matt Welsh. The other guy's name is Nick Gillespie. And Matt, Gillespie. if I catch you rummaging through my desk again, uh, there's going to be hell to pay. <laughs> All right, we're going to stop recording now. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Internet, and I uh, hope you enjoy.